Welcome to Highlands Live, an effort by the Highlands Community Association to better connect the community. This week, we welcome Dr. Adriana Lila Baum to the program. Adriana is a professor of sociology at the Delaware County Community College. She is the only woman of color who has ever served on the Red Clay Consolidated District School Board. And she is also the diversity and inclusion officer at the Delaware ACLU. Adriana holds a PhD from Temple, a master's from the University of Maryland, and a bachelor's degree from the University of Delaware. She is a mother of two teenagers. God bless her. Adriana, describe your Highlands for us. Really great group of neighbors, and most of the neighbors have kids. Now they're growing up and they're getting older, but I love all the kids in our neighborhood. So I like to, I like to walk every day. My preference is to get up and walk and do it early, but it's getting later and later every day. So that's <laughs> sort of my view. All right, so you grew up in Ninth and Ward area of Wilmington. Can you describe that neighborhood in Wilmington at the time? Sure. So um, I was born in Amherst, Massachusetts, and my parents were looking for a place to live, and they chose Wilmington, Delaware, for some odd reason. And we moved here in 1980, and we moved on to 21st and Jefferson. My parents had did not have jobs, neither one of them. We didn't know anyone. We didn't have any family. So we moved into Delaware in 1980, which was right at the front end of desegregation, which occurred in 1978, right, with a court-ordered mandate. And so we moved into the neighborhood very close to where Sheila Farrell had been shot. And if any of you remember, she was a 12-year-old African-American girl who was shot in her back and killed because she was on her neighbor's lawn and they said she had picked um, a peach mm -hmm. out of their tree. So we moved into Wilmington where busing was occurring, where, you know, a lot of civil rights conversation was going on. Yes, this was the 1980s, but, you know, there was a continuation of the the racial uneasiness and, and unrest that was occurring here. So we moved in to a primarily African-American neighborhood and I would walk to Warner for sixth grade. That's when there was sixth grade there. And I just remember my parents and all of our friends always telling us when we walk, be really careful. You remember what happened to Sheila, like stay out of people's yards. You don't want to get shot. Mm -hmm. So then I was actually bused out to Stanton and to Dickinson. So I grew up during desegregation with parents who were activists and very involved in the community. Um, and we talked about race and we talk about racism a lot. And we talk about, um, talk about, you know, the urban landscape and my parents were always very involved in everything. So their goal in life was sort of creating communities that were engaged and active in creating more equity and more, you know, inclusive spaces. And that really sort of still sits in me. Mm. That is extremely inspiring. And so how did that influence your academic focus? So I think because we were always talking politics in our house, whether it was about racism or sexism or, you know, gender, class inequality. My father was a Vietnam War era veteran. So we talked about the war and, you know, um, the United States going into different places. So I think that mired me in you know, thinking about social structures and the community and how we can make ourselves stronger and safer and how to organize people to get that done. So I think that's what sort of inspired me to become a sociologist. And when I was 17, I knew I wanted to be a sociologist. And here I am almost 52. And I'm so happy that was the choice I made and I would do it over again. <laughs> You, and that and that that role gives you terrific proximity to young people, right? We talked about that earlier and your passion there. You know, 16, 18, 22, 20 or that age. What are they experiencing right now as they sort of ex uh, deal with this COVID lockdown and this slow exit, global pandemic, this what feels like a national reckoning around uh, social racial justice, uh, this this feeling that maybe we're at a kind of inflection point of one for all, all for one. Um, how are you equipping them differently? How are they responding to the moment? W what are you hearing? So I would say I, I never want to speak for students, right? I think it's great to have them speak for themselves. And I feel like they're equipping us, right? Like I consider mm -hmm. myself part of the older generation. And I can just tell you that when we're, we're doing organizing or we're talking to students or, you know, we have right now, I'm not having kids in my house, but at one point I would have <laughs> you know, kids coming in and out of my house, 
they're 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 angry and they're upset but they're also very hopeful and they're passionate and they're energetic i mean um i i or helped organize a mark lucy comstock gay and i last summer at and we started from the wilmington uh from the delaware art museum and you should have seen the number of young people that were there students right people in college people in high school people in middle school my next door neighbor abby right she helped lead the march here she is in high school my daughter was there so it's just so exciting and then i went to the march um downtown in wilmington which they said was one of the biggest civil rights marches in Delaware, in Wilmington. And it was all young people leading that, like people 20, 25 years younger than, than me, I'm almost 52. And I just think that they're smart, they're examining history, they're looking at it, they're looking at how the movement today is similar to the civil rights movement. They understand how the Black Lives Matter movement is a, a, a legacy or a part of that civil rights movement. And that even before civil rights, we had the movement against lynching and segregation, and we have the movement against slavery, we have the abolitionist movie, movement, and they're all part of this cycle of getting us towards greater equality. And I think fundamentally they realize that that progress is not linear, right? That we make some progress and then we go this way, right? Through policy and laws that are generated and created. Then we organize and make some more progress. So I just think um, they're doing great things. Last summer you saw students all across the country, but you saw it right here in Wilmington and in Delaware, they were creating all their blogs talking about social injustice and racism and transphobia and sexism in their schools. We had students who came together across the state and created the Black Student Union that just came into existence in the last few months, where students are really, they're organizing, they're excited. And I, I think you see this too, because if you look at the rates of students applying for colleges, yeah. from community colleges, all the way up to our highest Ivy League schools, the numbers are off the rate, off the charts, right? Kids are excited. They're, they're hungering for a different world and they're making it happen, you know? And I say, let's join them. Let's get yeah. in the streets. Let's advocate. Let's teach them about public policy and the law and give them the tools, you know, to do this really terrific work. I mean, I have to say, I have my two kids here right next door. I have, you know, I have Abigail. And on the other side of me, I have Emily and Leah, and they graduated from CAB. And all of them, they're, you know, they talk to me about stuff all the time. We text and they tell me things, but they're active. I see them doing things. And I think they have a vision of the future that is that is bigger than perhaps ours was, right? Mm -hmm. They are more inclusive. They are more welcoming. They, they are wanting to do something different and they're making it happen. And I think that's thrilling. Oh, 100%, 100%. Yeah. Wow. Um, you, you, uh, I, I, the beauty of the internet is that you can, you know, learn a little bit about professors in particular, right? So your coursework is described as stratification with an emphasis on white privilege and transgender equality. Can you unpack that for someone who hasn't been in academia for a while and also give me a sense or us a sense of how your students reception may have changed over your course of being a professor uh, teaching this kind of curricula? So I would say, sure, yeah, I can definitely talk about that, but I would say less than them changing, I feel like I've changed, right? Uh -huh. So the, the work needs to be done, it, I realize now, you know, it had to be done with me, not really with them. So in the beginning, so I do a lot of, um, I embed my curricula with anti-racism work and work to be, uh, get more equality in terms of the LGBTQ plus community, you know, for, in terms of transgender rights, et cetera, et cetera. But in the beginning, I was giving them a lot of theory to read, right? Like really intense theory that I thought was fascinating and great. And I was also talking about stratification all the time, like inequality, let's talk about lynching. I'm gonna show you the pictures, right? I'm gonna show you about violence against trans women all across America. I'm gonna show you the pictures. I'm gonna read to you quotes, right? And it was very intense and that's fine, but I realized in doing that in a way I was breaking them, mm -hmm. right? Because it was devastating and it was horrific and it made students cry regularly in my class. And 
some students would come to me and they'd say, oh my gosh, I feel so hopeless. What can we do, right? There's so much inequality out there. So I said to myself, what can I do to really transform how I teach, right? Because I don't want to leave them feeling hopeless. So I started to integrate the curricula with a lot more um, resistance work and revolutionary theory and stuff about people coming together across different lines and organizing and strategizing. Um, there's a there's a professor at Princeton University um, who I know who's the chair of the African American Studies Department, Eddie Glaude, he's on MSNBC a lot. And he has a great new book and it's called Begin Again. And it's about James Baldwin, but it's about hope, right? And how do we ho have hope and optimism in the midst of all of this pain and all of this turmoil? And he says, well, we need a strategy for the streets. We need a strategy for the ballot box and we need a strategy for the boardroom, right? We need to work in all of these areas. So how could I bring that to students? And I think teaching them about about resistance and everyday people organizing and struggling and fighting back and actually making change. It was so invigorating and exciting for them, right? And I think one of the one of the things that makes me sad about education is that often um, students from a dominant group, whether it's in terms of race or gender or class, they're not shown the narratives. They're not told the, the stories of people who resisted, people mm -hmm. who were like them, right? Maybe heterosexuals or somebody who was white, right? Or somebody who was rich or affluent and had money, but they're not told the stories of how they get involved to create more inclusivity, right? And so I brought that into the classroom. So students don't just have one narrative to see, oh, my people only acted this way, but to say, oh, you know, my people are one of many and they acted in all these different ways and that gave them hope and that was exciting for them so i try and teach more you know along those lines and i also try and do more interactive activities because these students i like a lecture right i like someone talking to me <laughs> and i'm going to take my 20 pages of notes that makes me happy and then i'm going to go look at them but they want to be up for the most part they want to be doing things right so getting them moving around the classroom with little activities that you know they're not super fabulous, but they talk to each other. Yeah. You know, they, they they get to be creative and spontaneous and think about things. And I always start by saying, um, you know, I make a ton of mistakes every single day. So if you make a mistake and it was by accident or you use the wrong word, you're not gonna get beat up in this classroom for that. No one's gonna shame you, right? We're, this is a learning journey for all of us. And we can talk about why maybe you don't wanna use that word, but let's not, um, make people feel bad. Let's, you know, I was telling you earlier, people are using this term now, like, let's not just call people out and make people feel bad. Let's call them in and say, hey, this is why we don't want to use that term anymore, right? And I think that just works as a strategy, not just in the classroom, but wherever you go. Yeah, bringing, bringing folks in. Well, you should know that I will be lobbying to audit, um, you know, the email will be into the uh, your inbox by the end of the night. <laughs> Um, you know, folks, I, I, I shared this with you earlier, folks like Logan Herring and, and Ben Suzan have given me a real crash course as to this idea that it really just the last few months that Delaware is right in the center of this struggle, right, um, for, for racial justice that there's, you know, written into the Constitution, separate and unequal schools, redlining, you know, that we were a part of right in the Brown versus Board of Education that, you know, desegregation and busing and I, I, I'm interested to hear from you with a population that just can't even align on facts. How do you create a foundation to help people move to understand? What kind of examples do you have to help them understand structural uh, and or systemic racism? So I would say that one of the things that I, I try and do, I'm not always successful at it, but you know, I think defining terms often is really helpful, right? Just to start at that basic level, like what does sexism mean? What does racism mean? But one thing I've been trying to do more and more in my classroom and also with my students and the work that I do on the board is say, so, you know, we can talk about individual discrimination. We can talk about organizational discrimination, which is like discrimination enacted by a one institute, like, um, the school system or the military or the media, right? Religion, what have you, the healthcare industry. But then we have systemic racism, right? Which is when we have discrimination enacted via all of those institutions. So there's a, a woman named Marilyn Fry and she has this um, example she uses of the birdcage analogy. And she says, organizational discrimination is like looking at a birdcage really close to it and just seeing that one bar 
and you're like, oh, well, the bird can fly away. It can get away from that bar. But structural discrimination is when you step back and you see all those bars and you realize the bird can't leave, right? The bird's trapped. So when we think about systemic um, discrimination, regardless of the community that we're talking about, we're talking about how these systems operate in tandem with one another, right? Which really makes it difficult for people to um, get to a more liberatory place, right? And to be emancipated, regardless of really how hard they try, right? And some people absolutely make it out. And we could even say, hey, maybe lots of people make it out, but there's still systems that trap us, right? And uh, my son's 18, he's getting ready to go off to college, but he was working on his college essay. And, and we like to travel with our kids when it's non-COVID. And he was writing his essay and he said, mom, like if, and he gets his hair cut on Maryland Avenue and 4th Street, right? So he's, he's out and about all the time. And he says, mom, whether you're in the trenches in Wilmington or the trenches in Mumbai or in Morocco and Marrakech, the, the trenches are the same. He said, trenches are physical places that are designed to destroy people and kill hope right? To slaughter dreams. And that's really what oppression is about. And it's the same wherever you go, right? So how do we remove those structures or at least begin to eliminate some of them or reduce the gravity of some of them because we want to have more fulfilling lives for all of our people, right? That's, we want that, I would hope in my heart that we want that for everyone. We want more spaces in which people can make mistakes and not be killed for those mistakes, right? Um, so I just think that thinking about these structures, and I think to take people out of it is important too, because we're not always talking about someone not liking you because of X, Y, or Z. We're right. thinking about structures and policies and the law, yeah. which even good people can, you know, carry out or enact that has a negative or a harmful consequence, not just for an individual, but for a group. Yeah. Now I feel like I'm making everyone sad and depressed. No, no, no. <laughs> no, we're going to turn this into action. So okay. my question right. for you is that you co-chair Delaware County's uh, Community College Institution and Faculty Diversity Committees. That was a mouthful. So how might we as neighbors apply some of these key actions to be better allies and advocates and champions for racial justice? Um, what can we do to better our neighbors? Okay, so I think we have a lot of great neighbors and I was telling Benjamin earlier, I mean, I'm excited to be in this neighborhood because people have resources and I think a lot of people are using their resources in tremendous ways. So I would just encourage us all to continue to do those things. But one great thing is to do is, and it's really easy now through Zoom, is we can show up at legislative meetings right down in Dover and we can give public comment right from our kitchen or our bedroom or our yeah. living room. So those are wonderful things. And right now we're hearing house, we're hearing lots and lots of bills, but HB 198 is a bill that students helped design and create. And I worked with the committee for over a year. It was a bill uh, introduced by Representative Sherry Dorsey Walker, and it's to integrate Black American studies into the K through 12 curricula and have that be um, mandatory for graduation. So we uh, they took public comments in the um, the House Education Committee. They heard it on the floor last week, and now it's going to move over to the Senate, and they'll take public comments. So people can show up for that. Um, another really exciting, I think, opportunity that's in the process of unfolding itself is that in February, there was an op-ed written in the newspaper by Dr. Joseph Johnson's family, and it was um, asking about the renaming of one of the Red Clay schools after Dr. Johnson, who was the first black superintendent of Red Clay, right? And he gave testimony in the Evans versus Buchanan case, which was, you know, the Brown case. And so he's very, he, he passed away recently, but he was very involved in Wilmington. And they they asked, you know, if we, if the community would consider renaming Highlands after him, right? And so that's something we can talk more about, but I know the family is starting to work on um, the application process, which is really long and arduous. So they're going to talk to like the PTA, the principal of Highlands, but they want to talk to people in the neighborhood, the Highlands Neighborhood Association. But I think that's something that's really immediate, right? And it's really localized. It's right here in our neighborhood. I mean, I think that's a great conversation to start to have to think about. So that's, that's local. That's great. Thank you. 100% and something we can have a direct impact, you know, 
Okay, and it's so the fun part. Hold on, sorry. <laughs> I was just saying it's the fun part. We got a little wrap it around now. It, it I, I, don't worry, I work, I, not that Adriana, that wasn't, but I, this part is a little levity. <laughs> okay, yeah. So I do want to put a plug out there that we are going to open this up for Q&A in just a moment. So either ping in the chat or ping me directly that you would like to ask a question and I, and I will take you off mute. And now we're going to put you on the spot and ask you some fun questions. So um, what is your favorite dish and local restaurant? So I like Chiro's and I like their chicken and waffles. I love them. And um, I loved it when it was Moro. So I've been to the place at the riverfront. So I follow the chef all around. So I want to give him a shout out. And I also like, I don't know if anyone's had Robert, Robert Luler cook a meal for you and your family. So he lives in the Highlands and he cooks and um, Tizzy Lockman actually invited me to a dinner he was preparing for her and some of her friends. And we went to his house and he cooked an entire meal and it was absolutely wow. delicious. So it's like bringing food to your house. So he's wonderful too. And I like to eat anything and I like cocktails. So I like to drink anything <laughs> that's sweet and cold and fruity. <laughs> All right. All right. What about local beach? Local what? Pardon me? Your local beach. Like, where do you like to go to the beach? Oh, locally, I'd like to go to Rehoboth. Yeah. The All local. right. Um, do you have a local hero? J.P. Street Senior, who's mm -hmm. an educational activist and my mentor, and he's fiery and he takes risks, and I absolutely love everything about him. Definitely mentor, role model. Fabulous local hero. There she is. All right. And then your localish weekend escape. So we like to go to DC a lot. It's close. We get there quickly. And for a while, we were going to DC so much that one Thursday night, my son said, Mom, I want kebabs. So I said, All right, you want to go down to Newark? He's like, No, let's just go to DC and then we'll just come back for kebabs, chicken kebabs. So we like DC. Oh, that's fun. Definitely a bonding experience. So it looks like Dennison has a question. I did ask you to unmute. Dennison, you want to ask your question? Sure. I'm, I understand there's an upcoming uh, school election for Red Clay. Could you maybe give us some details and, and let me know who the candidates are and maybe even give us a, give us a hint about who might be the most progressive? Okay, sure. Thank you for your question, Dennison. I totally forgot um, to mention the school board election. So we have an election coming up next week, May 11th, Tuesday. Please vote. You can vote right at Highlands. And we have three candidates running, and they are all people who live in Red Clay. And we have Janice Colmary, Rafael Ochoa, and we have Kesia Neesmith. And I absolutely love Kesia Neesmith. I've watched her in a number of the, uh, the debates and dialogues they've had. And I think she just has um, a lot of common sense when it comes to education. She's also been an educator for 22 years and is currently a principal in the downtown uh, school system. So she has a lot of expertise when it comes to education. She's been on board. She's done strategic plans. So she, she, she's smart. And she has kids in Red Clay. She has a daughter at the Charter School of Wilmington, and she has a son at Conrad. So can, can you just can you just mention her name one more time? So because sure. I'm it's, slow. <laughs> it's Kesia K E C I A, and her last name is Neesmith N E S M I T H. And she's the only. Um, it's a, school board elections are nonpartisan. So I was going to say something, but I I won't say that. It looks like Jan Jessup has a question, unless I incorrectly read the No, I, I don't. Sorry. Oh, you don't. I apologize. All right. Anyone else out there have a question for Adriana? Or at 7.58. I have one more for you, Adriana, that, that we like to ask it towards the, towards the end of the, the, the program, which is um, if you just fill in the blank, right? If, if I had one wish, just you, if, if, if I had one wish for the neighborhood, it would be blank. I wish we would do more community-wide events. And Lindsay, I hear that you're like our event planner. So I'm gonna come to you. So yes. I, I once went in um, Midtown Brandywine 
I can't remember what they called it, but it was some kind of dinner thing. And you purchased a ticket and we went to like 15 different people's houses and we had cocktails at one house and we had dessert at another house and we had, you know, snacks over here. And it was fabulous. I loved it. I'd love to see us do something like that. Right. I yeah, a progressive dinner. That yes, is right yes, up my that's alley. what it was. It was yes. awesome. No, they're so, they're so fun. Yes. That sounds like a blast. That's a great idea. Any, anyone else on the call? We're so pleased you join us. Have a question for Adriana. Otherwise, we will wrap up here in a sec. Tim entered the room, but doesn't have a question. Anybody going once, going twice? We're so glad you're all here. All right. Well, um, Adriana, thank you so much um, for spending, you know, spending time with us today, for spending time with, me, uh, with us earlier to get ready and um, really sharing your expertise and your insight with us. What a treat. And I'm really looking forward to getting together in person. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. We got one question from, Mer right. from Meredith uh, G Keller Giacco. So Meredith, I'm taking you off mute. Unless you just raise your hand. Meredith, can you hear you? Hello? There you yep. go. You're on. Hello? Yeah. Um, hello? <laughs> They're paused. We can hear you, Meredith. Oh, you can? Oh my gosh, I had to walk outside so you wouldn't have to hear my kids and then I walked too far away. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I just had a question. I wanted to hear more about renaming of the Highlands. Um, I just missed that part, but I didn't want to interrupt anything about um, what kind of process that has to go through because I think that would bring great attention to the neighborhood and would be really beneficial for the school as well. So great question, thanks for asking. So red clay has a process that people have to go through um, in the naming of a school or in the request for the renaming of a school. And they have to get a number of documents together. And one is a document from an organization. So I know the family has a letter from St. Michael's and Andrews, which is where Dr. Johnson attended. Um, church. So they have to have a number of letters, then they have to have community input, there has to be a petition that has I believe 100 signatures on it. And then they have to talk at the talk to the school's PTO and the principal and the neighborhood association and get feedback and then they would present that that application packet to the district and then the district looks at the application packet and then it would have to go to the board and then the board would have to vote on it. And at that time, uh, the district would also take public comment from the community to see how the community feels about the um, request for a name change. So that's sort of the process. And I think the family's working on finalizing the process as we speak. I think they maybe have one or two more things to get in. So I, I think that they would probably make their request sometime in the early summer and then the board would you know, vote on it by the end of the summer or the early fall. That's great. Adriana, would you be willing to, to, to kind of give us a, a little short uh, talk about that? Uh, we're having a, a a meeting coming up uh, that that uh, Benjamin's gonna gonna make a pitch on. Uh, I think it's in about oh fourteen two week. It was Wednesday, two May nineteenth, seven p.m. So, yes, sir. So anyway, we we'll, we're gonna I'm gonna circle back with you and see if we can put you on the agenda if if you're willing. Yes, I'd absolutely be willing. And if people have questions that they'd like to send you, Dennison, that I could specifically prepare for before, that would be absolutely fantastic too. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. And, sure. and Adriana, I'll stay close. Um, I, I mean, I'm gonna stay close anyway, because we're pals. Okay. But um, I'll stay close on the topic and we can use the newsletter as a mechanism to be sure that people, people are engaged and, 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 uh, and, and involved. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you again for joining us, Adriana. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, please join us in two weeks. Um, uh, Sarah McBride, Adriana's uh, one of her, her, her partners and collaborators will be joining us, Senator Sarah McBride. Um, that's Tuesday, May 18th at 7.30 p.m. That's actually the sixth and final of our first season of Highlands Live. But it's all just a lead into what is really the event of the season. Uh, that's Wednesday, May 19th. Dennison mentioned earlier, the Highlands Community Association um, spring meeting. So again, that's May 19th at 7 p.m. We'll see you there. As always, you can read about all of the above at the Highlands Community Association.org. I'm Benjamin Wagner, that's
Lindsay DeSabatino, and we will see you next time.